Uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you for making the time uh, to join us uh, today. Um, I'll be speaking for about 20, 25 minutes, uh, taking you through um, our results over the previous year and also talking through uh, where we see the, the current opportunity, uh, the performance of the portfolio during a uh, you know, challenging macro environment, uh, and also where we see the market uh, developing, and then look forward to answering and addressing any questions that you may have as per the mechanism that uh, Neil has just uh, talked you through. But really, in, in summary, if we could, uh, you know, take it from the top, you know, one of the uh, benefits of the portfolio is that it is now really well diversified across uh, a number of the fintech verticals where we're uh, focused, and has shown real resilience uh, and strength uh, across uh, across the uh, the pandemic period to date. And you know, as at thirty uh, first of March, we continue to show NAV growth of six and a half p. And how we think about ongoing performance is at the point at which we uh, deploy our capital, how is that performing in terms of uh, IRR? And in terms of our invested capital since inception, that's um, developing a RR of 18% uh, so far to date. Um, and I think increasingly in this market, I think venture capital has come a long way in Europe and the UK in particular over the past decade. Um, it is more competitive. There's more capital, uh, which creates a burgeoning a market that develops more opportunities. Um, but you know, our role as one of the few specialists and the only publicly listed fintech fund uh, in the UK is that we see and access the very best opportunities in the market. And we remain very selective. Um, and you know, of the huge volume that we see, uh, we do invest in about half a percent of the opportunities that, that we look at. So the, uh, the opportunity set is large. Uh, there remains quite a lot of uh, noise in the market, and it's our job as a portfolio manager to really strip through that noise and identify the most exceptional opportunities in the market. Um, and, you know, we are still early on in this cycle. I think fintech, uh, more than a couple of years ago, for those of you that have invested since uh, day one, uh, presented a significant opportunity, um, but still was very early in its, uh, uh, I guess, in its evolution. I think it still remains early, but there is a lot more substance to the story. The market is here to stay. You know, we'll show you the, um, the depth of the opportunity, but also how much capital has been deployed over the last uh, couple of years. And I think one trend to really take away um, is that the accelerated adoption um, in digitization, where it really positively impacts a lot of the fintech sector, is something that uh, continues to persist. Uh, we've seen some exceptional acquisition opportunities across our uh, portfolio in terms of customers, and a lot of those customers we expect to, uh, to stay. Um, and just finally, in terms of the opportunity, one of the things that we wanted to do was to provide this diversified exposure to this uh, emerging asset class, one of the most exciting asset classes uh, developing in the tech space um, to uh, the public market investors. Up until now, I've had very limited opportunity to get exposure uh, to this and continue to do so as well. And I think the, uh, the, the following and support from retail as well as institutional investors uh, has been terrific and something that we continue to, uh, to see to grow. And in terms of where we are, obviously, you know, have hit headlines. I think important that we continue to deploy capital both Within our portfolio, some of the most exceptional companies uh, who are growing continue to have significant ambition, uh, but also in finding new uh, and exceptional opportunities as well. And you know, adding to the uh, portfolio uh, has been pleasing as well. And I think as important as that is that we are having support from other uh, institutional investors, not just venture, uh, but growth capital and later stage as well. And I think across the portfolio. Uh, you know, over 400 million has been raised in equity uh, over the previous uh, previous period, um, and I think it's incredibly important that you know, in a market uh, that is that is competitive, that is growing, uh, that we are seen to be backing some of the most exciting businesses. And I think you can often take some of these awards and uh, and lists with a pinch of salt. It's not our aspiration to actively be promoting these companies in these lists, but to be recognised often passively and independently. And I think some of the very best uh, and most credible lists uh, that exist out there, our portfolio are often featuring quite prominently and in some cases regarded as the most exciting opportunity uh, in the European fintech ecosystem. 
And I think, you know, as we look at, uh, you know, the post year end March uh, 31st feels quite a long time ago. The portfolio continues to, uh, to progress, continues to capitalize on opportunities, whether it's interactive investor acquiring the share center or whether it's receipt bank, one of our new investments acquiring uh, Xavier as well. And I think, you know, when we look at the uh, kind of post pandemic opportunity and the platforms that have been put in place, you will have noticed the likes of uh, the bounce back scheme, the C bill scheme as well that, been put, that have been put in place. What's been really important for our portfolio where relevant is to be able to uh, capitalize, to collaborate uh, with these government schemes to ensure that their underlying customers can benefit uh, and really allow these businesses to, uh, to develop further as well. And I think pleasing as well was the uh, full license uh, application of, uh, for, of Zopa uh, to become a fully fledged bank, which has been uh, a long and at times uh, somewhat painful process, but I think puts them in a tremendous position going forward to be able to now capitalize uh, on their prowess, uh, prowess as one of the top uh, consumer lenders, albeit of a clean uh, balance sheet as well. And I think as importantly, uh, the portfolio has continued to be able to raise, which I think is a uh, you know, real sign of strength uh, during the last, uh, last few months. Uh, and you know, in some cases, really to further their, their growth opportunities uh, as well. And we can touch on, uh, on the detail there uh, in some areas. I think one question that investors often ask us is, you know, when you raise that capital, how quickly can you deploy it? We do not want significant cash drag. And I think since IPO, we always talked about deploying our initial capital within that 12 to 18 month period, which we did. And then in our equity issue last summer, uh, very clearly looking to be able to put that capital to work. And we very much are, uh, are focused on that. We talked earlier about identifying exceptional opportunities, but also having a very significant pipeline of opportunities as well, which we continue to refine uh, and work through as well. So I think at the point at which we raise capital, we have this uh, healthy tension of uh, what we regard as compelling deal opportunities uh, to be able to put that capital to work. And that very much is our, our ambition as a fund as we continue to look to grow the trust to capitalize on this uh, developing asset class. Um, and as you can see, in terms of you know, how we have been deploying that, it has been uh, you know, a steady increase. We continue to make progress. Uh, we believe there's you know, significant potential ahead within the portfolio. And often in venture capital, uh, a lot of the opportunity takes time to gestate. We are backing at times very early businesses that hold lots of potential, but still uh, quite immature in their, uh, um, in their development. Uh, and of course, you know, riddled with risk at times as well. And it's our job to be making sure we're balancing that uh, with the portfolio, and we'll talk to you uh, how the portfolio is spread across the different stages um, of, of development, which we define as Series A uh, down to uh, pre-IPO as well. But I think what is pleasing is that we continue to make that, uh, that progress, uh, despite the fact that there is significant uh, growth still to come across many of the portfolio. And here, really, you see how that progress has uh, has been made over the over the previous year. The green is really where you're seeing uh, the uplift, um, and the orange is where you're seeing a reduction. And I, I think just touching uh, on kind of many positives across the portfolio, clearly, interactive investor and tide and, and bullion board of businesses uh, that have made great strides uh, in the past 12 months, continue to attract a lot of interest, continue to grow considerably. Uh, in particular, in uh, you know, in a post-COVID environment, there is a lot of demand for uh, for, for the uh, for the trading platform. So you will see, uh, in particular, the likes of Interactive and Bullion Vault progressing very effectively. I think just to note that not everything uh, always goes to plan, and I think the challenge uh, there, the biggest kind of detractor from the portfolio, has been the uh, funding round is over, as I said earlier. Uh, the opportunity ahead of it, I think, is quite exciting. I think the challenge for them was raising that regulatory capital, very significant amount of regulatory capital, at an extraordinarily difficult time uh, for them uh, late, last, uh, late last year. They had that regulatory capital. Uh, the raising of the $140 million was an important milestone that allowed them to push forward. Um, uh, but we had to realize you know, a significant reduction in valuation in order to get that deal over the line. But you know, we think there is a good opportunity to, uh, to grow from there uh, as well. 
And I think, um, you know, we are not actively uh, focused uh, on seeking positive headlines. We'd rather our work and our underlying portfolio does the talking. I think what has been, uh, you know, pleasant, uh, pleasantly surprising has been the amount of coverage that we've got um, from, you know, very credible um, publications, both uh, that appeal to the retail investor, but also to the institutional uh, investor as well. And I think it's a really important feature for us uh, to let our portfolio performance do the talking, but also for us to be on the front foot where we do have the opportunity to speak with uh, you know, relevant commentators um, or press. Um, and you know, for our investors, I think they want us to be able to punch, punch above our weight. And also, uh, you know, when it does come to an exceptional company, we should be very much at the front of the queue. We want our founder community in the European fintech ecosystem to want to take money from Augmentum above others. And I think it's incredibly important that we maintain that profile and get the balance right there as well. And in the portfolio, as I've touched upon, you know, what is key for us uh, as a manager is to give that diversification, not just across stage, but across the underlying asset classes within fintech as well. And I think we're very pleased to have that diversification. We, you know, we have focused heavily on the disruption in the underlying banking space, in particular in the SME, but also looking at the huge opportunity in wealth, wealth and asset management as well. And it is an industry that's taken time to disrupt. Um, we have backed some quite innovative uh, and differentiated players in that space, but we're seeing increasing opportunity uh, across that area and certainly something where, you know, we will be looking to deploy further capital uh, over the coming 12 to 18 months as well. And then something which we call fintech enablers, really perhaps we should call it infrastructure uh, or the rails, those businesses that are underpinning not just uh, the growth uh, in fintech, but also underpinning uh, some of the challenges and solving some of the problems of incumbent financial services companies as well. Those that are built on legacy technology stacks and are struggling in some ways to compete uh, with those very competitors uh, that we're helping to fund on the right-hand side here as well. And I think there has been a sea change approach uh, amongst the financial institutions, the legacy players who see uh, these enablers as you know, very credible partners uh, technology solutions to perhaps propositions that they thought they could solve themselves. And I think there was a far greater level of engagement uh, in the marketplace and certainly an area where we are spending increasing time uh, and effort and focus, uh, not just with the portfolio companies, but with other opportunities where we would like to get increased exposure. Uh, but this isn't the, uh, you know, the total universe of FinTech. There are other areas where we continue to look at closely, whether it's uh, insure tech, whether it's decentralized finance, these are areas as a team we continue to develop our hypotheses, but also spend a lot of time with a number of companies where one reason or another, it hasn't been the right time for us to deploy capital. But you, will, you should expect us uh, as a manager to be building out, uh, not just uh, within these categories, but also in new categories as well. And as importantly, is making sure we're getting that portfolio balance right in terms of uh, evolution. And the weight of our capital is not just geared towards one particular area. Yes, we recognize that we want to back exceptional early stage businesses that have hugely uh, significant potential and attacking very uh, you know, developed markets with significant uh, revenue pools that perhaps haven't been disrupted uh, as much as, uh, as other areas. Um, but these businesses can take time to gestate. Uh, as I said earlier, they can be uh, risky. Not all of them will, uh, will deliver uh, you know, knockout returns, but we are looking for exceptional opportunities there. At the same time, we recognize that our investors want us to see, uh, want to kind of witness uh, realizations within a tighter time period. So over the next couple of years, our ambition as well is to you know, look to work with our portfolio companies that are you know, more mature, uh, profitable, still growing, still have exciting prospects, but look to uh, realize uh, you know, those investments uh, and deliver realized returns to our uh, investors as well. And so it's important that when we look about that when we look at our portfolio construction, we're continuing to make sure we get the balance right. And I think we're quite happy to have the weight of capital closer to the exit door, but the number of companies in the portfolio it, during that, uh, are still during that gestation period and still uh, earlier, that over the next two, three, three to four years, we'll move across uh, you know, the cycle into the mid and to the later stage as well. 
And you know, a question I get asked more often than not is how has the portfolio uh, performed uh, during the pandemic, both until the end of uh, March, but uh, beyond as well. And I think this is just really a, uh, a snapshot of how we are seeing the portfolio in the first half of last year uh, versus the first half of this year. Um, and I think you know, across you know, across the board, what we can say is. Uh, you know that the, the portfolio companies have managed the uh, pandemic and the challenges that it's brought exceptionally well. Um, I would say, you know, as, as a majority of the portfolio, they have continued to to trade uh, strongly. In some cases, exceptionally well. You know, I've alluded to uh, both Interact Investor and Bullion Vault as businesses that have, have grown tr- uh, tremendously uh, during the last few months. But also, there are some businesses uh, that are really coming of age. If I highlight the likes of Farewell, uh, which is uh, you know, one of the first businesses to digitize the, uh, the wills and uh, probate business in particular, death uh, you know, is, is a challenging subject to discuss and has been an industry that has been beset uh, by lack of technology and lack of disruption and innovation. And I think they're doing an exceptional and extraordinary job uh, and really bringing some much needed change to uh, that industry, seeing some significant growth and year on year to give you a sense that business has grown over 800%. Um, and then perhaps highlighting a business that uh, if you look here, Habito, which is a digital, digital mortgage platform, it is you know, what we would regard as an impacted sector uh, during COVID. Uh, but they have seen uh, record revenues um, in the last couple of months. And why is that? It is because, you know, it is a classic example of a business benefiting from consumer uh, behavior shifting, uh, where consumers that perhaps have been a stubborn demographic to shift to digital propositions, albeit that they are more convenient uh, and more transparent and often uh, and most likely cheaper, uh, are now being forced to do that. And I think as they've seen the benefit uh, of these digital platforms, um, you know, they are now unlikely to shift back to how they were uh, perhaps behaving uh, and interacting with financial services in the past. And I think, you know, they would be, Habito would be a great example of a business uh, eating market share from traditional platforms as well. Um, of course, not everything uh, can perform as exceptionally as some of the others. We have uh, you know, Zoka, which I've alluded to, Iwaka, which is uh, an SME lending business, uh, has you know, immediately uh, shifted to how can we, one, uh, you know, manage the, the challenges uh, of an SME lending book uh, that is in some distress. And I think they've done an exceptional job in helping cure the book in, uh, in the last kind of four or five months, um, but also adapting the product set to effectively um, uh, you know, change uh, and uh, appeal to a different uh, different environment. And you would have seen the launch of the bounce back scheme, which competed with their uh, core product. And so, you know, they have continued to evolve and develop new product sets. I think the beauty of being uh, a digital first proposition is that you can be adaptable and nimble, uh, and also being accredited themselves to issue uh, C bills as well. So, you know, as I've said, I think. Uh, for the majority of the portfolio, uh, they continue to kind of build and develop uh, and to grow, perhaps at the expense of the competition. Uh, and those you know, that have been challenged have really come through uh, some very challenging times and put themselves in a strong position to capitalize going forward as well. Uh, I won't uh, touch uh, in any detail, and uh, this is available on, uh, on the website, but I just wanted to, uh, in the last uh, four or five minutes, just talk about and where you know where we've come and the opportunity ahead uh, as well. You know we are now regarded uh, as one of the most active fintech investors uh, in Europe. Uh, recently, actually, in the past couple of weeks, um, you know there was a uh, you know piece of analysis done that had us in the top four or five fintech investors across Europe in terms of quality of, uh, of companies that we've backed. Clearly, that's subjective, but it's nice to be. Uh, recognized and talked about in those terms and something that we continue to uh, hope we'll continue to uh, feature on. And secondly, as an asset class, uh, I think one of the attractions that we've seen and when we've talked to uh, those investors that have uh, you know, come on board and invested in uh, venture capital and fintech for the first time has been you know, the underlying performance. Venture capital uh, over the past decade has outperformed public equities. And I think if you are going to focus on any specialist area within venture, and fintech is clearly one of those areas that is the most attractive. And I think we look at this in terms of you know, performance of fintech relative to the rest of 
uh, venture, and it is the strongest performing area uh, there. So I think investing both in venture and fintech uh, has proven today to be a, uh, you know, a strong asset class and one in which we think has got uh, significant opportunities ahead as well. Um, and you know what does you know what does that mean? Well, yes, uh, I think when we first you know launched uh, back in 2018, we were we were talking about this is an asset class that is uh, very early and continue to develop, and you can see that in the weight of capital that has been invested over the past couple of years, and you'll continue to see that over the year we're going through right now. But yet, when you look at the penetration uh, of what we would regard disruptors in an enormous market, a ten trillion. A dollar opportunity. It is still very early. If you transpose, uh, you know that chart across every other industry, most industries would see significant double-digit uh, penetration. Uh, and I think therein lies the opportunity. One, uh, you know, the genie is out the bottle. This is no longer, uh, you know, what we would regard as, you know, all hype. There is significant substance uh, to this underlying industry. It's here to stay. Uh, but there is a long way ahead for those investors that worry, you know, have I missed the boat? Uh, well, certainly, you know, the boat has, uh, has left the port, but it's only very uh, early in its journey. And I think that is where, you know, we're particularly excited that we've built a strong brand. We've built strong building blocks, uh, but we're excited at what the, uh, what the future holds. Uh, and we look forward to, you know, continue to work with our shareholders to, uh, to capitalize on that opportunity. Um, and finally, so what does that you know, future opportunity mean? Well, of course, we continue to want to back uh, you know, the very best uh, companies in the portfolio, continue to help them grow, but also to capitalize on some of those areas that we are particularly excited about, both within the sectors where we have exposure already, but also in some other areas, which uh, you know, I discussed earlier in the likes of InsureTech. Um, and I think for us, you know, when we look at this, this should always be a multiple of the amount of capital that we have available. We want that healthy tension uh, in the, uh, you know, in the investment team. We want to make sure that the exceptional opportunities rise to the top. But it is, in, you know, it's incumbent upon us as an investment team to make sure that we're seeing, uh, you know, almost everything in the, you know, in the market that we can. We need to make sure that we have coverage. We need to make sure that we continue to build. Uh, the relationships with uh, with the founders, uh, the founder community across the fintech space, across all of, of Europe as well. And I think what we have built over the last uh, two and a half years is a very significant watch list as well, which is incredibly important that we continue to manage that, uh, nurture it, and be able to capitalize on that, those opportunities that we think are, are ready uh, for our investment. They come at the right time uh, and where we believe we can add value uh, as a uh, as an investment team. So I will uh, I will pause there and uh, hopefully Neil that was exactly 25 minutes and uh, see if any questions have uh, have come through. Perfect. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, we've got a couple of questions coming through. Um, first question about the IRR. You say that the IRR of 18% on invested capital has been achieved. How does that sit versus your expectations and the budget that you set? Yes, it's, I mean, it's a good question. I think, um, you know, one needs to have some caveats around that. Ultimately, the, the true test um, of us as a, uh, as a fund will be delivering that delivered realizations. And I think, you know, high teens, uh, you know, low 20s, absolutely kind of venture uh, venture returns, and we absolutely aspire to be delivering those types of returns to uh, to investors. Uh, as a uh, as a team, our minimum hurdle for us as a, as an incentive is is ten percent. Um, but you know, when we look at any new opportunities, our baseline in terms of how we analyze, we're looking for a minimum RR of thirty percent. Uh, of course, we you know love to be able to achieve that. Um, but uh, you know that that would be an exceptional performance. We think our investors would be happy, uh, and you know I know having spoken to many of them, that we, if we could deliver them high teens or or low twenties, that certainly would be something that uh, you know they would be uh, would be happy with. But yes, we aspire to deliver the best you know, possible returns. But uh, you know there there comes a, a balancing act of uh, making sure we can balance the risk over time as well. Okay, and another question from the same source actually is about uh, dividends. Um, which of the companies we're invested in currently pay dividends? Well, 
that would be a rarity, I would say, in venture. Um, the uh, you know the, we are looking to back businesses that are growing, um, and we want to make sure we are reinvesting where possible into that growth. Um, we do have a business that that uh, is paying a dividend, and that would be Bullion Vault. That is a business that uh, continues to generate strong profitability. Uh, has a very strong balance sheet, um, and in the absence of us being able to capitalize on further growth by investing in further growth, um, then it does pay out 70 to 80% uh, of dividends. But for us as a fund, uh, it is all about, you know, it is all about growth. It is investing in growth. I think by, by the time a business is delivering uh, dividends, then we should be looking at saying, well, can we be reinvesting uh, our capital into a you know, higher growth proposition, and I think that's why what investors would be uh, would be looking, uh, you know, for us to do. Um, another question, Tim, is: Are there any new disruptors to have emerged from the COVID lockdown period? In the uh, uh, in the I guess in the fintech space, is that? Related to, I mean, so have there been, you know, I guess maybe perhaps I'll answer and interpret the question. Uh, have there been any themes that have developed post COVID uh, that perhaps weren't as prevalent prior to COVID within, within FinTech? And I think, it, you know, that, that is a fair question. Um, I can only speak in terms of where we are focusing our energy. So, you know, are we focusing our energy uh, looking at new innovative lending businesses? Less so. Uh, we don't feel that's an area over the next 12 months that's going to see you know significant opportunity. We have seen increasing, uh, clearly increasing opportunity in the kind of underlying infrastructure, which, we, which we've talked about earlier. The big incumbent financial institutions are you know, challenged with some very significant uh, tech issues, as an example. And so they are looking to the market to help solve uh, some of their problems. And so the likes of Onfido uh, would be a good example of a business, uh, you know, that is that is benefiting. Of course, as well, uh, you know, savings. How are uh, consumers going to be saving in an environment where there is zero interest rate or even in a negative interest rate environment? So how can you capitalize on, on that as an opportunity? Uh, we've seen the advent of, and growth of the likes of neo brokers, I guess Robin Hood equivalents. And so, you know, we're continuing to to follow that. Uh, you know, an area where you know we uh, we've talked about in the past uh, where we haven't had exposure is is crypto. Uh, it's not an area where we think the centre of gravity is in Europe, but increasingly we're looking at you know what what is evolving in that market in terms of what they call DeFi, which is decentralised finance. Uh, and how you can use the underlying technology, uh, in, perhaps in a more mainstream way. And I think that's an area where, you know, we as a team are spending more time and thought and making sure that we have the depth of understanding there. So I think there are clearly areas of real uh, interest which are we think will benefit. Uh, some of them we have in the underlying portfolio, so we want to continue to support and help our companies grow in that regard. Uh, but also some areas where we don't necessarily have direct exposure, and, and those would be along the areas that I've talked about, uh, where we as a team are spending an increasing amount of time uh, and focus as well. Um, and then we've got uh, a few questions, Tim, actually, um, all along a similar theme um, about plans to raise new money for the company. One of the questions is, what's your thinking on the overall size of the fund over the coming years? And another one, more specifically in the near term, talks about the fact that we're trading at a premium to NAV at the moment. And are you considering a fundraise to improve the secondary market um, on the back of that? Yes, yeah, so it's good questions. Um, I think one, you will have seen the scale of the opportunity in terms of the market opportunity and where we are. So there's no question that over the next five years, uh, this, is an, this is an industry that's going to grow considerably. We think we're well positioned to capitalize on that. I think we've made no secret of our ambition to grow. We think the trust can be considerably bigger. We think the demand is there. Um, we're clearly pleased uh, with the with the trading performance from a share price point of view, and I think you know it's our ambition, and I know it's our board's ambition uh, to to continue to grow the trust. Uh, you know, one to uh, you know bring on new uh, shareholders, 
um, and obviously allow our existing new shareholders to continue to uh, to expand as well if they have the desire. So I think you know we're working with our brokers, uh, you know, and the board uh, to share the story, to spread you know to spread the news uh, and articulate that. So I think you know we'll continue to to look to be able to grow, and I think if the market conditions are, are right, then certainly from uh, from my side, you know, we'd be very keen to uh, to raise further capital to be able to capitalise on on the significant opportunity out there. Okay, and another question, Tim. I'll take a couple more questions now. Is about exit um, on the assumption that you'll always look to exit at IPO. Uh, will there be other opportunities to exit before stage in a company's development? Yes, I mean, I think we always talked. Um, for those that listened to the IPO pitch in March 2018, we always said three years into the portfolio in 2021, we, we feel that we have the first uh, first exit, and we're certainly targeting 2021 as that uh, you know as that period of opportunity. But at the same time, I think what's really interesting in fintech is the vast majority of exits to date have not come through IPO. In fact, 95% of exits have come either through sales to incumbents, which who are increasingly active in the M&A space, uh, or, it, or, or to uh, you know, private e equity or other institutional investors. So the challenge for the public market investor is how do you get exposure to this asset class? If you want to wait until these companies are mature, then you're going to miss out on 95% of the opportunity. And secondly, because companies are staying private for longer, they're taking, you know, they're taking instead of five to six years, 10 to 11 years to get to uh, IPO, you're missing out on a lot of that growth trajectory uh, as well. So I think that, again, is a, uh, is a strong benefit of uh, you know, backing us uh, as, as an alternative way of, of playing this asset class, because you are going to see uh, to date uh, you know, much, you know, a small, a very small minority of these companies coming to the public market. Um, and I think that is why you're seeing an increasing amount uh, of activity by institutional investors uh, at the later stage in the private market. Um, and, you know, as we said, you know, you will see an increasing uh, activity from the large financial incumbents that see fintechs uh, as a competitive threat at times, but also the risk of their direct competitors, established competitors, getting hold of some of these companies such that they will look to, uh, uh, to be acquisitive as well. And, and I think that is certainly a trend that will persist uh, over the next two to three years. And you, know, you will have seen the likes of Visa and PayPal and MasterCard and Santander all becoming uh, you know, active, making some very significant uh, acquisitions uh, in the fintech space. Uh, and, we, and I can only speak for ourselves in terms of the amount of kind of inbound of noise uh, that we hear, but two years ago versus today, uh, it, it is very different. The amount of engagement from uh, the global financial institutions in this sector uh, is, uh, is is night and day different in terms of their interest today than it was perhaps two years ago, which is encouraging. Uh, for us, it's encouraging for exits, uh, and we're absolutely not going to be reliant on uh, the IPO market uh, to uh, to deliver all our exits. 